Okay, so let's just um, go ahead and start. We already see a, a few of our attendees um, coming in from all across the country, uh, some from our Northeast, some from Florida, from California, nice, a nice mix, Michigan, and Illinois, of course. So welcome to our Senior Local Government Leadership Webinar Series hosted by Zen City. Today, we're gonna to focus specifically on counties, their challenges, and best practices. My name is Uri Mahler, and I am a customer success manager here at Zen City, meaning that I work closely with our various local government partners. I'm honored to have here today with me four guests from three of our county partners from across the, count, uh, the country. From McHenry County in Illinois, we have Scott Hartman, who is the Deputy County Administrator. He has been since 2014. And prior to that, he was a City Manager at, at Highwood, Pangree Grove, and Marengo, all from Illinois. And Alicia Schuler is the Assistant to the County Administrator, who joined the county in July of 2017, while she was pursuing her MPA. From Nevada County in California, we have Molly Dick, uh, who is the assistant CEO, and she joined the county in 2012 and became assistant CEO in October 2018. And from Ottawa County, Michigan, we have Al Vanderberg, the county administrator, who has, has been the county administrator since 2003, and prior to that served as a deputy county administrator of Kent County and city manager of South Haven. So they are all going to share some of their main challenges and success stories throughout the COVID-19 crisis. But the idea for today is not just to have a presentation, but more of a conversation. So please feel free to ask questions and talk about what your county is doing that is interesting. And there's a few ways that you can do that. You can either use the chat option, which was uh, preferable, and there will also be places where we we'll ask for questions and then you can raise your hands. <coughs> and uh, once you do that, we can unmute you and allow you to, to ask your question with your voice. <laughs> so um, just to get the ball rolling, um, I'd be happy if you could use the chat and type in your name, where you're from, and what is the main challenge that you're currently dealing with in your county in light of reopening, which is a big issue that we're seeing across uh, pretty much all of our clients. So I'll just give you a second to start and do that. And um, okay, that's gonna be ongoing and we're gonna answer the questions as they come in through the conversation. Um, what are we up for today? So we have in a small introduction about Zen City, which I will give. And then uh, from McHenry County, our dynamic duo is going to talk about communication challenges in a world without benchmarks. From Nevada County, Molly is gonna talk about adjusting to a new normal regarding census, local businesses, and working remotely. And Al is gonna talk to us about laying the groundwork to prepare for crises. And at the end, we're gonna have a, a short Q&A. So I'll start off by explaining a bit about Zen City for those of you who don't know us. Um, Zen City is a software and services solution for local government agencies. We help um, those agencies to collect and analyze resident feedback. Today, we work with over 130 local governments across four countries with the vast majority of them coming from the US and Canada solution, uh, you can see a, a few of them here in the list. Our solution applies artificial intelligence and advanced algorithms to analyze high volumes of resident discourse in real time from a multitude of public social and news sources. This allows local governments to quickly identify resident concerns, understand resident sentiment, and inform senior decision makers. Now, working with this wide variety of local governments, we know you all have uh, some of the hardest jobs out there. Uh, you serve and guide your communities, and that means that you are in a constant challenge to prioritize, 
resources are limited, needs are various, and deciding on what's best for your communities is challenging. And getting the data on that, uh, um, getting the data and, base, uh, and numbers to base your decisions on is hard. It takes up substantial resources and is often limited to what we call STPs, or same 10 people, or same 20 people, or same 30 people, depending on how big your county is. What we at Zenshid are saying is actually that local governments don't need to work that hard because a lot of the feedback is already out there. People are posting, tweeting, interacting with messages they care about, and that is valuable feedback. So our solution collects and consolidates all of those interactions, passes them through an algorithm that automatically gives each interaction its own sentiment and category, and then turns that aggregated data into actionable insights to support decision making and evaluate policy. So now with no further ado, let's get right to it and let you hear what our partners in our counties are doing. First up is our duo from McHenry County, Scott Hartman and Alicia Schuler. And my first question here is, what should we know about McHenry County so people can get a feel for the place, other than that it is the home of the largest tool festival in the US. Or that, sorry, it's the home of the uh, largest milk festival in the US. Harvard, Illinois, uh, home of uh, Milk Days. Um, and uh, thank you for that shout out. Um, and I'll start off, and Lisa, you can fill in any, uh, any information that I miss, because I tend to gloss over a lot of things. But um, just in a nutshell, McHenry County is a county of about 308,000 people located northwest of the city of Chicago. And uh, it is along the border of Wisconsin, which as of late became a very important consideration in any of our discussions and messaging because of you know, recent changes to Wisconsin related to COVID. Um, the county is really as a mix of of small suburban communities and a lot of rural um, offerings. Uh, we have a lot of recreational offerings through conservation district um, and a lot of farm fields. And in fact, the eastern side of the county is, our, is more populated. That's the side that faces Chicago. The western side uh, has some beautiful farm fields and some of the best, uh, the, the best um, uh, land that you'll ever see in the world, um, really rich soils. Um, we have about 30 municipalities total within the uh, within our borders or, or overlapping our borders, um, but there are no major cities. Our largest city is the city of Crystal Lake uh, with about 40,000 residents and our, our key employment centers are uh, manufacturing is the largest, um, governments, whether it's county, school district, park districts, or municipalities um, represent a significant uh, portion of our employment base. Um, retail uh, is a fairly large sector and healthcare is a, is a really large sector within McHenry County. In fact, our largest employer is, um, is a Northwest Medical um, Center, um, I'm sorry, Northwestern Medical Center, um, which used to be Sintegra Hospital System um, here in the county. So we have really good hospitals in this area. Um, and that was an important factor as we planned our response to COVID because as you know, hospitals, beds, um, and your hospital capacity was an important part of the conversation. But we were really well equipped there. Um, and prior to the 2008 housing boom or housing bust, McHenry County was one of the fastest growing counties in the country. Uh, in fact, it held that title for a brief period of time, I think right around uh, 2000. Um, so, uh, so we had a lot of growth and development in, in a short period of time, um, but uh, that really, it, it, it was done in a very responsible manner. So a lot of the assets that the county has are, are embraced and it's a great quality of life offered to those residents. Um, so but, Scott, let me just, um, um, I want to, to kind of dive into where, we, what are the kind of the main challenges that we wanna um, talk about today. I think that was a really good kind of overview of, of um, kind of feeling where, where we are in terms of the county. Um, so, one of the main things and main challenges that we're seeing across pretty much all of our clients um, is that communications is a huge thing now with, with COVID-19. Could you tell us a bit about the main challenges you've been seeing regarding communications and how you've been dealing with them? Yeah, well, that's, that's been a challenge at the onset of, uh, of this because, as we all know, the information changed day to day, 
hour to hour. Um, and, and keeping up with that was, was important. And our residents were, and our, and our elected officials were, were hungry for information and uh, we couldn't provide it fast enough and accurate enough because it would change. The message was, would stem from the CDC and then it would go to IDPH. So it was our job to, to carry on and extend uh, those two information sources. But then we had to translate it into, you know, into the impact it had on our local communities. But really the first step was keeping up with it. And it was because it was changing so much, uh, that was a challenge. The second part of it is since there was so very little known about COVID-19, it, it was hard just to communicate out what residents needed to know, what our businesses needed to know. And so I think just keeping up with it and the ever-changing landscape of information was probably the number one main, uh, uh, main challenge. Um, what we did as a county is very early on, we activated our Joint Information Center, our JIC, as you know, and that's um, through the, um, the National Incident Management System, uh, the Incident Command Structure. Um, we activated that um, to bring together a, a multi-agency approach to the messaging. Uh, we have uh, representatives from our health department, county officials, municipalities, law enforcement, school districts, our healthcare system, uh, representatives from our recreational sectors, um, and just a variety of different um, PIOs, public information officers from our various partner agencies kind of came together and uh, informed the JIC. And from there, we can then talk about the messaging, talk about what we needed to say, what was needed today, what was needed tomorrow, and what we anticipated within the next few days or next week so we could stay ahead of that messaging need. And that multi-agency approach was important because it ensured that we were all, in essence, saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. The fact that we were dealing with this changing informational environment, you know, we, we would be working against ourselves if we didn't come together locally and figure out what that message needs to be so we could communicate that out to our residents our residents and our constituents whom our agencies overlap and so that they would get information consistently at least from the county level and um, you know that, that's one of the things that helped um, and it was really good to have that group of discussion because through it the messaging needs change now early on it was a public health concern in fact it remains largely and wholly a public health concern but as the COVID-19 pandemic evolved, the, the public health information didn't necessarily fall to the wayside, but it became overshadowed by other needs in, that, that arose. And in our Joint Information Center discussions, we recognized that uh, within, the, within a few weeks, as the, uh, the shelter in place, stay at home orders were starting to um, take their toll on our populations as the employment uh, was going away as the economy was going in, you know, uh, was, was being severely impacted. Uh, recognized that there was a need to shift our messaging, not only from the drumbeat of the, the public health message of, you know, stay in place, uh, wash your hands, um, you know, wear a face mask, et cetera, beating that normal drum, to bringing on our, our mental health board, our mental health community, to put them at the forefront of the message because we recognize that our population needed to know what resources are available. And um, so, so the JIC was helpful in identifying what needed to evolve in just the overall messaging. And I, you know, recently it was the uh, mental health, currently, currently now it's the business climate as we look at recovery. So it's that ever-changing theme of the message or focus of the message uh, that came out of the JIC. I just want to ask, um, I got this, Alicia shared this um, report that you used for that. So Alisa, can you tell us what we're looking at? Of course. Um, right now you are looking on your left hand side at our Sun City dashboard. Currently we have various projects that compartmentalize the different aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we also have it subdivided into different issue areas, such as the local economy issues involving public health, public safety, transportation. We even have it broken down into the various municipalities um, that are major within the um, within the county itself. So this is a lot of information to really be able to absorb in just one sitting. 
what are one thing. So what we did um, is we have a volunteer who has very graciously agreed to, you know, help us sift through the data that density collects for us. And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side. Uh, somebody who went through, you know, the different items and, you know, pulled out the different highlighted items from Zensity as well and reviewed the, all the different comments made. It was able to give us a high-level summary that had the qualitative as well as the quantitative analysis in there. It also helped us to find um, just uh, a pulse, essentially, of our community based on the data we received from Zensity. Um, and it would come in different. It would come on a daily basis. Um, you know, the, we would update um, every day and send out a new one of these reports to the JIC, um, so that our community partners would also have their fingers on that pulse too. So that we, when we would come together, we would be we would be all be equally informed. Wow, that that that's great. Actually, uh, Alicia, we can hear you kind of back. So um, maybe. I, I don't know. Scott, I don't know. Can you try and answer as well because the volume that's uh, audio coming in from from your microphone is kind of off. Uh, okay. So just um, could you could you tell us, for example, this uh, yeah. this information? Would that something? Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, I apologize. Uh, we, uh, a little choppy, I think. Lisa did a great job explaining what this is, but I'll reiterate. Um, so what you're looking at is um, it's it's it, it's a, the Zen City tool on your left hand side. That's really, that really the dashboard um, that provides the the data, and that comes out daily. Um, and then on the right hand side, you'll see a, it's a narrative, and we have a, um, a volunteer uh, who's actually was a student and, and serving as an intern. Um, and every day would take the Zen City data kind of digest it, boil it down, analyze it, and produce that written report. And that report was then provided to the JIC each day. And in their, in their discussions and when we would meet, um, this, the, this would give one more, one more tool for us to look at and refer to to understand what is, what is out there in the, you know, what is out there in the, in, in the world? What are, what's some of that, I call it the chatter. You know, what are people talking about? What are they, what's on their mind? And what's important to them? What's not important to them? What is, potentially what information do they need um, or what information is perhaps uh, misinformation that's out there and would, would allow us to understand that, you know, that, that, that chatter and, and understand what we would need to focus our message on. So, and that helped us, you know, to, you know, to know when we needed to pivot um, into, as I mentioned, the, the mental health board message or to uh, the, now the business related message. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it was, you know, it was, a, it was a great analysis because it was without that we wouldn't have a good understanding um, as to the just to the chatter out there as to what what people are thinking, and what's on their minds. We would be doing it in a vacuum. So, so that great. that helped expand what we can what we can say. Great, wonderful. Um, so I also wanted to ask, um, you know, now that uh, you're you're managing the communications, this is actually happening in a very dynamic and unstable environment, as you very well described. Uh, and this is a different situation from other crises, right? When you have like a tornado, you know when it starts, you know when it, when it ends, you know where you are and what to do at every stage. This, is, this has kind of fuzzy boundaries, this kind of crisis. Mm -hmm. And I wondered what that means for planning ahead, for example, with reopening. It, uh, it, you know, and that, I think fundamentally uh, that's been one of the the greatest challenges because there is not a playbook for this. All the, all the, um, the, the planning out there really focuses on, uh, you know, a physical disaster or some acute event that, you know, that, that is really has really distinct lines and, and this doesn't. Um, so, so I think that the, one of the challenges has been understanding where we are and where it's going. And as the information changed, then we had to adapt and respond to it. Um, so, so all the, traditional conventional planning and playbooks were out the window. What is also unique about this pandemic compared to what, you know, the, the traditional playbooks would say is that the information um, was really, it was really developed uh, by the JIC itself. And unlike a, a tornado where we would rely on the emergency operations center to provide that information or to be the source of that information, to us as the PIOs and then we could message it out. It, it wasn't developing fast enough through the EOC 
And so then it became uh, incumbent upon the JIC to develop and analyze that the information and messaging need. We would refer to the JIC. We would we would um, uh, confer with or, or confer with the EOC uh, on what we needed to do. And and there were times where things would pop out of there. But for the most part, you know the. The, the JIC had the, the responsibility of understanding what that messaging need was and communicating it out. Um, you know, it, it has been very dynamic and very fluid. And without benchmarks, the challenge is, is knowing, it, trying to understand what we had to respond to or what we had to, to say. And that's why I think that collaborative discussion of, of the multi-jurisdictional approach, getting an understanding of the various sectors as to what they're seeing or hearing would help us understand what we needed to message out. So, you know, and as we stand today, we're we're still in the you know we're neck deep in it, if not more. But the you know we're looking at our messaging needs, and we know that the economy and the reopening of the economy is is the hot button issue. What does that look like, and how do we how do we message out you know, the uh, the the appropriate way our county needs to open up while still being responsible and resilient against the fear of that second wave of, of COVID, which we're, we're fearing about. Okay. Um, I just, uh, sorry to cut you off. We just, um, we need to kind of, just in the sense of time, move kind of on. Alicia, you just wanted to say one more thing. Uh, wait, I'll, we'll open your microphone. One second. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, one of the things that you know is helpful even in a vacuum without benchmarks is and I, it's something that the city does provide or at least in my opinion the unofficial versus the official um, channels to see how the interests co um, correspond with one another do we have some real proportions of posts and interactions in our messaging that goes to local economy versus things that go to public health and you can kind of get an idea give or take um, whether or not you know, you're you're mirroring those um, those interests. So, I mean, just but again, it's an evolving situation, and it really is so clear what Scott has said. So I'll just reiterate, I'll just reiterate. And, and just for anyone that had um, um, audio problems. Um, so what Alicia is saying that is there's the uh, uh, ability to see official versus unofficial data, and then see what's resonating in those other channels other than the ones run by the county and, and kind of seeing if the, if the messages are, are disseminating correctly and, and you're locking on to the right issues that are coming up in the community. And I think that was, that was uh, very interesting how you deal with the communications efforts and how you do that in a collaborative way, which is very helpful in this kind of dynamic environment and, and really always changing. Uh, and thank you very much for that. We will now move on to Nevada County and Molly. So, hi Molly. Can we open up Molly's microphone? There you go. Good morning. Uh, so Molly, what should people know about Nevada County so they can get a bit of a feel for, other than that, it was the last county to have dead or alive posters. <laughs> That I didn't know, so thank you. I'm going to use that in trivia. Um, well, hello, everyone. So Nevada County is, by California standards, a small county. We have about 100,000 residents. Uh, we have three incorporated cities or towns, um, and we sort of span from the valley through the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas up uh, to include the town of Truckee, which is just north of Lake Tahoe. Um, and our eastern border of Nevada County does border the state of Re of Nevada um, at the city of Reno. So uh, we have similar border uh, challenges, as Scott mentioned, being next to another state with a different approach um, to, to addressing this pandemic. Um, Nevada County is, is very much a small town kind of community and rural community. We have a lot of retirees here. We have a higher proportion of older adults, which uh, mean we have a higher proportion of the vulnerable population to the COVID-19 virus. Um, and it's very much a tourist community. And so we're being hit hard um, by the lack of travel and the lack of the tourism economy and, and very much dependent on small locally owned businesses. We have very few big box stores or corporate um, employers here in Nevada County. Our hospital 
and our government are our two biggest employers. So uh, with our conversation, I, we heard from Scott and Alicia a bit about running the communications aspect of the crisis. We'd like to now talk about the crisis impact on some additional strategic aspects. So one major effort that was very much interrupted by the crisis is the census. And we know that in many rural communities, there is a, sometimes a big digital divide. So how do you reach out to places that are a bit, um, where people might be a bit less tech savvy or, or accessible to technology? Yeah, we are partnering with our 211 provider, which is hopefully other communities have this. It's similar to a 411 or 911, but uh, 211 offers information about all of the social and social services and government services that are available in the community. And so 211 has really um, been our major outreach partner. The original plan included uh, in-person events, kiosks and pop-up events to try to encourage people to do the census, which of course now is not an option. Um, and so they've really focused on, you know, how can we use existing channels to meet, especially the hard to reach um, households. And so we've been working very closely with all of the community partner organizations that provide social services, behavioral health services, um, even just outreach to seniors, Meals on Wheels, food banks, those types of organizations to help push the message about completing the census. Um, we've also mailed postcards to every household, but also every P.O. box, um, because a lot of rural residents use a P.O. box instead of getting mail delivered to their home. And for some reason, the official census um, information coming from the federal government does not get sent to P.O. boxes. Uh, so we made an extra effort to, to reach out uh, by mail in those, um, to those residents. In addition, we're just doing a lot of outreach um, you know, some through social media, but as you mentioned, Yuri, not everyone has access. Um, so we're also doing ads on the radio, in the newspaper, um, and re really trying to reach out, um, you know, through banners in the community and just anywhere that people might already be looking or, or seeing that information. Um, we've also been having regular Zoom meetings with all of our community partners to check in on how their outreach efforts are going. And we noticed that particularly in the town of Truckee, our, our response rate was very low. Um, so the statistics I got this morning is that at this point, the national response rate is 59.6%. In California, it's 60.8%. In Nevada County overall, it's 54.1%. But in the town of Truckee, it's only 28.7%. And so we've been working on uh, phone banking and phone trees with our community partners, specifically reaching out to our Spanish speaking population um, in the Truckee area that tends to work in a lot of the hospitality industry um, to make sure that we're trying to reach that hard to reach population and, and working through our family resource centers um, and our other uh, organizations that specifically support our Spanish speaking residents in, in the Truckee area in order to reach them. That's really, that's really creative, I think, using those different kind of um, um, channels and maybe, you know, a bit more, you, some would say traditional, but then um, actually effective in these cases. So um, moving on to another issue that is very hard hitting for a lot of counties, another major facet that uh, we see is being um, taking a, a real hard blow is uh, local businesses and especially in those unincorporated communities. So tell us a bit about what you're doing to help them. Yeah, so this, this picture is a little heartbreaking. This is a vacant storefront um, in downtown Nevada City that uh, there is now an art project going on working with our artist community to paint um, inspirational messages on vacant storefronts. Uh, we, as I said, we're very much tourism dependent um, in our economy and some businesses have closed temporarily and other businesses have, have just given up and, and decided they aren't going to make it. And so we do have um, sort of a disturbing amount of vacant storefronts at this point. Uh, we are really trying to work with the state of California and the California Department of Public Health to coordinate on the reopening plan. Um, 
as I'm sure others are, are dealing with, there's a lot of pressure locally to open faster than what the governor has um, dictated will be the statewide plan. And of course, in a rural community, you know, our, our COVID-19 um, case counts and our, you know, our risk level is lower than in the urban areas, particularly the Bay Area and LA, which are having um, much higher case counts. So, you know, our businesses are really struggling and they're wanting to reopen. Um, we're providing guidance as far as best practices. We have a business task force uh, Zoom call that's open to any business that wants to participate every Wednesday afternoon from four to five. And we cover different topics from how to apply for the PPP loans to you know, what workforce supports are available to, you know, we started a Nevada County Relief Fund um, seeded with county dollars and then we received um, two times matching dollars from donations in the community to help support nonprofits as well as our business community with um, small loans and grants for those who didn't qualify for the state and federal resources. So we want to continue to support businesses and communicate with them. Um, we also have a reopening advisory committee that represents different communities in different sectors that is compiling all the best practices and, and what can businesses do to prepare to reopen and then providing that information to our health officer. And with his blessing, we're publishing that information on our website so that businesses have template plans for reopening and template trainings for their employees and, and those sorts of things. Um, one thing that just showed up in my Zen City Digest this morning um, is the conversation about masks. And in our community, um, we have not required people wear masks in public. Um, we didn't require businesses to have their employees wear masks when they reopened. We really wanted businesses to identify what worked best for them. However, we're receiving a lot of public um, input that they want masks to be required. They want people to have to wear masks in public. And so we are working with our restaurant community starting to say, yes, your employees need to wear masks in the front of the house that are interacting with the public. Um, and we'll see how the mask uh, conversation evolves because it, it's become very divisive in our community. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure others are seeing this as well, where we have people who are, are, are shaming others either for wearing a mask or not wearing a mask in public. And it's really, it's really become quite um, sad that that's how people are interacting with each other. So we're definitely watching that discord very closely um, through our Zen City tracking. We see that, by the way, across all of our clients uh, currently, the whole issue of masks and how it's pertaining to uh, how people feel about their liberty and their rights and privacy and everything. So that's very common. Um, another common issue that we're seeing, again, across a lot of our clients today is what that means internally, what, how the, the you know, clients that are counties like you are now moving to work remotely. Uh, people have been working from home for a while now, and we haven't talked about how that looks like, how, how do you deal with day-to-day -day, um, meetings and, and um, kind of messaging? So what are we looking at here? Could you tell us? So um, this is data that our IT department just provided uh, last week about the use of Microsoft Teams. And so as you can see, before the pandemic, we really had very few employees. We have 800 employees across the county, um, and we had very few employees who were using Microsoft Teams for anything. Um, and then you can see right there in the middle of March how it really spiked and everyone was expected to be using Teams to, um, to track their employees who were now teleworking um, to you know, stay in touch and help those employees feel, feel um, supported and, and to communicate regularly. So we ended up transitioning about half of our workforce to telework and we're really relying on uh, Microsoft Teams to um, to have ongoing staff meetings and chats and have supervisors stay in touch with their employees. Um, and you know, today actually we have a, a lunch and learn, which is something that we used to do um, in person, but we're doing those now via Zoom and so that all of our employees can log in over their lunch hour and learn about something with the county. And as you can imagine now, almost all of our lunch and learns focus on COVID-19, what the county's doing, what are our reopening plans, how are we supporting employees, 
um, what are their resources as far as leave if they need to take time off and and you know their family matters and everything else so um, that's really been telling to see how we've been able to pivot to um, remote work and staying in touch electronically versus having everyone in person. Great. Thank you very much, Molly. I see questions come up. Um, and actually, Alicia, you, answered, you already answered one of them. So uh, someone asked for the census, how do you know what your submission rate is? And then Alicia put in the, in the chat a link to where people can go and see the breakdown of numbers by census tract, by city, by state, by, county, by county. So thank you, Alicia. <laughs> uh, we'll move on. So Al, actually, um, before we talk about what people should know about Ottawa County to get a feel for it, <laughs> I wanted to, you also have um, uh, a stake in, in how working remotely looks like, right? You also did a transition on that. Uh, yes, uh, we transitioned about probably 45% of our employees to working from home, uh, set up over 300 VPNs in about five days, and uh, it, it worked really well. In fact, we have a number of revenue areas where we actually improved with people working from home. Uh, we still have a lot of real estate transactions happening, so our deeds revenue actually went up, uh, court records, dispatch records. Uh, we got a heck of a lot done with people working from home. So those that had jobs that maybe didn't lend themselves as well to working from home, we also rolled out nine new training programs uh, to supplement what we do as a county with training, which is fairly substantial uh, over the net and had, I think we're close to 2,000 separate courses taken since mid-March when we closed her down. Uh, and that includes, uh, we did our EAP through uh, Pine Rest, uh, and we actually had over 500 employees access one of three offerings uh, that they offered about stress during COVID and that kind of thing, you know, had no idea that that'd be accessed that much. So, so yeah, we've had a good experience with it. And uh, in our conversation prior to the, to the actual webinar, you talked about identifying which um, kind of roles could work from home moving on as well. So some, some of the roles that you were in, when we go back to, the old normal <laughs> or a new version of the old normal. Um, which kind of those kind of roles do you think uh, or do you identify now that could possibly work from home? Yeah, I think that uh, we found that our friend of the court folks uh, can manage uh, their client base very well from home. Uh, we've also found that those that uh, deal with records processing, we have a very uh, heavily used, uh, myottawa.org is our website, and, you know, we've been uh, growing uh, rapidly for years as far as the number of transactions done over that. And so, uh, you know, our clerk's office, uh, any office that's uh, dealing with taking reservations like parks uh, or doing the online work, they can do that from home just as easily as they can from the offices. Uh, and so really it's those areas that don't involve managing other people, public interaction, teamwork, uh, we still, I think, will prefer that teams meet in person where possible. Uh, also, we've gone to open space office concepts, and there really is something to how people work together just in the informal interactions that they have during the day as far as idea generation for innovation uh, and that type of thing. So we're not ready to leave everybody at home, but certainly as with all the uncertainty of where COVID uh, is going, uh, we'll probably bring people back a little more slowly than we would have otherwise. Uh, we have a question coming in, actually. So someone asks, um, do you have any issues related to employees taking confidential information home to work there? How do you manage the risk of others seeing the info or it getting lost in transit? Well, all of the work is being done through dedicated VPN lines. And so they're accessing uh, the systems of, and on the county servers from their home. So I guess, yes, there is a matter of trust that they're not, you know, photocopying that information and somehow leaving it uh, in a risky area or something like that. Uh, but for the most part, you know, because of the culture we've been able to build here, we do have a high level of trust. And, uh, and, and, and I think we've also, one of the other things we've done, most employees are just sending a quick note to their supervisor in the morning saying, hey, this is what I plan on working on today. 
We're doing a lot of teamwork through Microsoft Teams, Office updates, that type of thing. So I think the connectivity uh, between uh, the supervisors and work that's being done is helping quite a bit too. Great. So another thing that um, I wanted to talk about, you have been, uh, we, you have the longest tenure of, out of all of our speakers here today. You've been in, in the city for 17 years and a lot of the local leadership in your county pretty much grew up with you as a constant there. So how has that helped you in managing the situation now with all of your communities? Well, I'll, let me just say that I inherited a very toxic environment with employees and with our local units of government. With our local units of government, the county was viewed as an 800 pound gorilla. I don't think we had ever had county administration in any of the local unit town halls. But being a former city manager myself and suffering through relations in, in other county contexts, I brought, a, I think, a different vision into the job as far as how I would love relationships to be with our 23 cities and, well, 17 cities, 17 townships, six cities and a village. And so we started doing uh, quadrant meetings. We met with uh, in each quadrant of the county, uh, so four meetings a year. And we did a local unit newsletter and we started building relationships to the point where today we have probably 30 service agreements within the last five or six years where we are the IT department for 10 of our local units or we are the fiscal services department or we are you know, so we've, we've built up a lot of those partnerships so that everybody actually works very closely together now. And uh, it's, it's great to uh, have transformed that. And when in a time of crisis, it's just amazing how people work together then. We haven't had any sniping or people working across purposes or that type of thing. So actually, um, you talked about working together and how that served you at the crisis. What are we looking at in this picture, by the way? Oh, that is a part of the Grand River Greenway. So this is a 10 foot paved path that will start on the beach in Grand Haven. I should say Ottawa County is located on the shores of Lake Michigan. So we have flooding going on right now too, by the way. Um, and uh, so this pathway will go ultimately from the beach in Grand Haven to the city of Grand Rapids, which is Michigan's second biggest city uh, in Kent County. Uh, 28 miles of the pathway will be in Ottawa County and linked seven parks and, and another six natural areas. It runs through the campus of Grand Valley State University, uh, the main campus for Grand Valley, and then ties also through to uh, their Grand Rapids campus along the route. Uh, so it's, it's uh, pretty fantastic. And we're within about four years of finishing it. It's been in the works for almost 30 years. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing here. So. In, even though we're measuring public opinion on Zen City uh, during COVID, we're also trying to measure public opinion on some other things uh, like the Grand River Greenway. Uh, we started citizen surveys and employee surveys uh, my first year on the job. So, you know, I know that we've measured uh, 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 support or satisfaction with county administration and the board from our employees has gone from 28% to 80% over that time, surveying every other year and to our citizens, we're up to 80% as well. And so uh, the, one of the cool things about Zen City is I can, I can have a citizen survey 24 uh, seven. It's different and I get that, but it's really neat to be able to tap into what people are thinking and not having to wait two years for the next, uh, next information. And we'll still do that, that survey because it's a little bit different and, and it is statistically significant and all those kinds of things. But, yeah, I, that's one of the cool uses of Zen City. Wonderful. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're using it for that as well. We know that um, for our uh, pretty much all of our clients, uh, being able to kind of get a glimpse of, um, we call that like uh, the pub chat, like what people would say in, a, in an unofficial circumstance um, and tapping into that and being even proactive about it is very helpful, especially in times like these. Um, I also wanted to talk about innovation and you talked about the smooth transition to working remotely and how you have the technology in place to do that. And in Ottawa County, you have also other unique examples of the technology you used. And um, I wanted you to introduce us to Francesca. Oh, sure. Yes, yeah, so Francesca is our um, 
kind of our greeter robot. And uh, we deployed her almost a year ago now. Uh, we spent about, well, six months working on a pilot. Uh, we think, we've been told, I'd love to hear if there's others that could be in a support group with me, actually. But uh, we, I think she's the only robot on duty in local government in America at this time. Uh, but basically, we have a facility that confuses people when they step into it. We thought about a kiosk, but kiosks confuse people too sometimes. So we employed Francesca, who can actually greet people and then actually speak with people about where they're going or can send a text to departments to tell them uh, when she's arrived for, when somebody's arrived for their appointment. Uh, she was the first robot of any type to have the Amazon voice technology in her. That did not work so well for an institutional type purpose. So we ended up putting Microsoft chat box technology in her and that's worked fantastic. So uh, we're still kind of tinkering and messing around and figuring out what more we can do with her. I was hoping to uh, maybe have her take temperatures when people come in, uh, but we aren't quite there yet. Um, so anyways, it's been a good solution for us. I didn't have to staff this area, which saved $85,000 in the first year, and our ongoing costs are about 10,000 a year. Uh, she will speak Spanish as well. Uh, and so again, it's the beginning of, a, of, a, of a artificial automated intelligence. Uh, we're using that in, in many different areas now, but this is kind of uh, one of the more unique ones maybe. So I think that's a good uh, demonstration of your openness to innovation. And I wanted to ask that and also the, um, you know, other, other technologies you're using. And I think that I, I wanted to ask how that helps you prepare to a crisis like this. How, how well, I, yeah. So I, I think that, well, let me very quickly say that we've also uh, took a few years to work with a company and different teams around the county to build an innovation playbook. So we have a playbook with 177 plays in it, which helps teams get unstuck. So we rolled out lean, which is more of a right brain thing. And the innovation piece is more of a left brain thing. And by engaging people and encouraging people uh, that you know what, you use different thought processes for different situations. And sometimes you just need to think uh, more innovatively uh, and get unstuck. And I think the sum of those efforts, plus we did a major customer service initiative that you could read about in the third edition of the Disney Way, where chapter 13, uh, where every single employee was changed, uh, trained in Ottawa Disney Way customer service principles. That has brought people together in a way I never could have imagined and kind of created a framework where people are, uh, understand that it's okay uh, to think uh, innovatively. And very quickly, I'll just say what I learned during that whole customer service process was that people need to be told that it's okay to do cool, innovative things. And they need to be told it's okay to take care of customers in a fantastic way. They're really concerned about, about getting jumped on for doing a good thing. And I, I had never really understood that because I've always been either the intern, the deputy, or the uh, manager or administrator. And so I've always kind of resided at the top and, and that's a blind spot I have. Great, I think that's a very interesting perspective. And um, so we are now going to move to our Q&A. And uh, if anyone has a question that they want to ask or they want to answer, uh, they can either put it in the chat or raise their hand and we will open their microphone so they can actually respond. So uh, one of the questions that we have here already is, um, would anyone like to answer, how are you keeping track of the homeless and veterans? Any of our panelists? Scott, yes. One second, go ahead. Uh, you know, that's a great question. In fact, when COVID first came upon us, that was one of the very first elements of our response. Um, we have, uh, through our community development department, a uh, pretty robust system um, for our continuum of care for the homeless. And that's a, that's a, it's a multi-partner system that really maintains an inventory, or I guess that's the right word, but maintains a, a roster of our homeless population. And so, so they were pretty much known and um, when this first came on us, um, we used grant dollars that we had available to us. In fact, it was CDBG dollars to um, leverage that into um, uh, to non-congregate care 
for our homeless. So basically, we put them up into two hotels um, to, you know, through the COVID so that they would be safe and that they would be protected and they would be cared for. Uh, and they actually are there today. Um, and so that's been a, a couple months. That's going to be coming to an end. We're working on uh, what that plan B looks like. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's how we addressed our homeless population. Um, veterans, we actually have, uh, through our Veterans Assistance Commission, a pretty um, uh, active department that um, does a lot of outreach to, uh, to their clients. And um, I've not heard the, from our VAC any, any issues or concerns. The biggest challenge with COVID was that they had to stop doing the transport for medical appointments. Um, and uh, there's a, a few VA hospitals in the area that they would routinely uh, transport veterans in need of appointment. But with the need for social distancing, um, with the need for that separation of good practices, we unfortunately had to end that. Um, but uh, from what I'm understanding, we haven't seen too many issues come out of that. So I don't know if that answers the question, but those are really two important considerations, especially when COVID first came on us. Definitely. And we have another question that came in uh, earlier, and that is, uh, how are you going about your revenue forecasts? And especially, you know, now when everything is kind of in the midst of not war, but whatever this is. <laughs> so yeah, Al, go ahead. Uh, we'll just open your mic one second. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, we're doing two things, obviously, and it's almost too early to tell. It is in some ways, but for our county, we're keeping track of uh, our revenue from services and areas where uh, some revenue has gone for good, like tickets that were never written because people were staying at home. And in other areas, you know, court dates were, were delayed and people are going to have to do that. And so we have some areas where we expect a rush when we open up. Uh, and in some cases, money keeps coming in over the net. And in others, there is some revenue that we've lost for good. Uh, and then the other real question mark is our state government because they're going to get hammered on income tax and sales tax. But again, you have to look at what kind, this isn't looking like it's going to be a great recession kind of curve. It looks like it's going to be more of a, you know, the huge drop that we had, probably some sort of recovery spike that may not come near the amount that dropped. And then the question is, uh, with all the people that have been, been making unemployment, and unemployment in excess of what they were making in their pay, you know, the trillions of dollars we're spending to support all these things, is that going to leave the economy in a quicker recovery mode, or are we really in for some kind of long-term malaise? And the other thing is looking at different scenarios. So one scenario we're looking at is, you know, happy times are upon us. The other is that it could be a 1918 situation where every two to three months it comes roaring back. And the other one is that now that everybody – appears to think it's uh, cool to go outside and, and congregate again, that we might get slammed again right away and that it could be worse in the first round. So we're trying to look at these different scenarios and put numbers to them as best we can. It's really difficult with how early this is yet. Yeah, I see actually, uh, Molly, you also added a response to the homeless uh, question. So maybe you could um, stand on that for a second. Uh, just open your mic, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, we have a homeless outreach and, in me and medical engagement team that we started actually over a year ago. And, um, and that team has been going out to visit the homeless camps. There's, you know, caseworkers, but we also have a nurse there. And the nurse has been great because she can uh, connect with homeless individuals around any physical health challenge that they're having. And that's been a great way to build rapport and um, build trust amongst that community. And so we've been able to, um, you know, bring anyone who ha is symptomatic into a isolated hotel room or to get them to the doctor if needed and to help them with their medications. Um, we also uh, rented portable hand washing stations like you would see with porta potties um, and put those in strategic locations around the community so that the homeless population would have access to washing their hands. Um, and we also distributed some, some kits out in the homeless camps that include hand sanitizer um, and other um, products to help them maintain their their own sanitation in the camp so those are some of the outreach we've done and and so far we haven't had any homeless people test positive which has really um been great okay so we are uh open for 
another question. Okay, there is another one, let me check. We have, one second, no more questions. Okay, so uh, I really wanna thank you all very much um, wholeheartedly about uh, taking the time to share with uh, what you've been learning uh, from us. Uh, I just wanna say that before people kind of dash off, we still have uh, our tools that we can that um, are here to support our users and our clients in um, working with uh, COVID and managing it. We have our daily digest. We have project dashboards. You saw a few of these um, today. We have our community of champions on Facebook, uh, and we we also send an email with a presentation and a video so people can share this. We also have a webinar coming up next week, uh, next Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, about specifically about college towns and how they've been uniquely impacted. Um, but again, I wanna thank again our speakers today. Uh, it was really uh, interesting. You gave us practical tips, you gave us deeper understanding and inspiration. I think this is really why we do these conversations with local government leaders. Uh, you, we know you're on the front lines and I think it, just to have you take the time and, and talk with us is really humbling and really valuable for all of our uh, clients and people listening in. Um, that's uh, pretty much all we have for today. We can uh, stay on if people uh, have any or any other questions. We'll stay on for a minute or two. Um, I see a lot of thank yous coming in. <laughs> <laughs> That's for you. Uh, we see a, another question that came in. How many of the homeless were veterans? Anyone want to answer that, Molly? Yeah, we do track that in our point in time count that we do. Um, I don't. I don't know off the top of my head, um, but we definitely do do track that and make sure that our veteran service office connects um, with those individuals with all of the benefits that they're entitled to. Okay, perfect. All right, so I think we also wrapped up just in time. Um, we like keeping the time here. <laughs> I know it's not very Israeli, but that <laughs> that's uh, us. So uh, thank you again for taking the time. Thank you everybody for joining and uh, join us next week for our next webinar. Thank you everybody.